Okay, let's let's begin. Hey everybody, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Hopefully everybody is having an awesome day. Look who I have here in front of me, in front of you. I have a typical security guard and I'm gonna interview him, ask him some questions. Now, if you guys don't know, I do work in law enforcement, but I don't work in private security. I am not the boot on the ground. So what I was doing when I started setting my channel up is I was looking for other channels that have valuable input. And I came across um, a typical security guards channel. And I noticed that he has a lot that he has a lot of valuable input. And there's there's not a lot of good security guard channels over there. I think his is one of the best ones. He's one of the channels that I trust. Um, I was subscribed to some other ones. I will not mention them. And I just uh, disconnected myself from them. Um, he is one of the only security guard channels that I am subscribed to. So uh, thank you very much, Damien, uh, for having such a great channel. Hey, I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot for asking me to do this. I, you know, I've been on the other side of the camera. So this is, uh, this is cool. I appreciate it. Okay, great. Okay. Can you tell us about your professional background? Uh, yeah, well, so, you know, obviously it all starts in the military. Um, I served six years in the United States Air Force, and I always say six years for this very interesting reason. So um, I enlisted in 1996, way back in the day, uh, right out of high school. And as I'm going to the recruiter's office, my dad, he says, uh, hey, make sure you read the fine print. And I'm thinking, fine print, what fine print? And he goes, just, you know, you're signing a contract, make sure you read the fine print. <laughs> so I get to the recruiter's office. Um, I'm going over the information. And right before I sign that little warning that my dad had given me, it kind of kicks okay. in. And so um, I think it was Ferguson was the last name, uh, Tech Sergeant Ferguson. I said, hey, I said, what's the fine print? And he goes, fine print? There's no fine print. And I said, well, my dad said to ask about fine print. He goes, well, the only thing fine print wise that you're going to find in that contract is this. You are enlisting for four years, but technically you're enlisting for six because you have four years of active duty and you have two years of what's called inactive duty. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, but listen, no, 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 wait, don't worry. There's literally nothing that's going to happen. That's going to cause them to reactivate you after those four years. Okay. He goes, and this is literally what he does. He goes, it would take something like Pearl Harbor for them to recall you. Well, let's fast forward four and a half years later, 97, 98, 99, 2000, August, right? So September 11th of 2001, what happens? Oh, something. <laughs> Damn near identical to Pearl Harbor, right? Right. So it wasn't, I think maybe, you know, the, the, by the time the, the planes had fallen in Pennsylvania and I had already moved to Kansas City, I had just had my second child. We bought a house. I'm working in the private sector. The military is really far in my rearview mirror. So I thought. Right. Right. And, um, I just out of instinct, I called my, my old base and I'm talking to the master sergeant, my, my old supervisor. And I'm like, hey, man, like I'm a little worried here. And he goes, what do you think you signed up for? Like, this is what we do. It's game time. And I was terrified. And it was maybe three months after September 11th that I got a letter in the mail and it just stated, this was from the Department of Defense, that I still had time on my inactive reserve. If I were to uh, leave the state of Missouri, I had to contact my old base. I had to let them know where I was going to be, let them know how they could reach me. And I'm literally like, from the time that I got this stop loss letter, all the way until uh, 2002, so August of 2002, when I got a letter in the mail that said, you have completed your active and inactive reserve status, uh, you are hereby honorably discharged. And you know what happened is after September 11th, it took a little bit of time for the military to kind of figure out what they were going to do, um, you know, how they were going to proceed. And I didn't have enough time left on my stop loss uh, where I was necessarily going to be actively recalled. So that's a very long intro into how all of this started. But 
that was my first introduction to security, my first introduction to firearms, um, to operational security, talking about certain things, not talking about certain things. And at the time, I went into the military just shy of my of my 18th birthday. Um, so I was extremely young. Looking back, I wish I could have done so many things different, you know, because it really afforded me such a great opportunity. It really put me in so many great uh, positions to be successful. But I was young. I didn't like authority at the time. Uh, I didn't like structure at the time. But that's what kind of got me started. Um, I went on and, and, and opened gymnastics schools. I've always been a gymnast at heart. My family ran a gymnastics school. I knew that's what I wanted to do coming out of the military. So 2003 started my first gymnastics school. I had that school until 2008 when I went through a divorce. And if anybody watching this channel has ever gone through a divorce and you're a man, you know, you pretty much liquidate and lose everything. And that's exactly what happened to me. So as I moved into another uh, state going into Pennsylvania, and now I'm paying child support. I had just filed for bankruptcy and I needed secondary income and secondary income for most men who are, let's be quite honest, middle age, you know, they fall into either security or corrections. And I got into corrections working in Pennsylvania. I did county corrections for a year, uh, looked into moving into state corrections. And I, I, put in the application for the state corrections job, pulled some strings, knew some people, got into state correction, but it was such a, a vast difference in how the prison system is run versus how the jail system is run. Um, I really, it, it's, it's hard to get people to believe this. I enjoyed working in the jail system. Um, it was, it was very respectful um, we were very uh, cordial to the people that we were dealing with, but we really weren't dealing with a lot of high level offenders. When I went to the state prison system, it was a whole different ball game. The clicking up by race um, within the system, the gangs within the system, how hardened everybody was. And when I say that, I mean the uh, criminal aspect and the officers. And that just did not mesh with my personality. So I got out of that state uh, prison system and a friend of mine was working as a constable. So in Pennsylvania, since you have such a rural area, they still um, have what's called magisterial rule. So you have magistrates, which are low level judges. And if you think of your, your city um, and then you have your town, you have your little municipality, all of these smaller little areas, and these might be places that have, you know, 300 people in terms of the population. Um, they utilize this magisterial system to uh, levy fees, fines, and taxes for small misdemeanor crimes. Well, since you have these small magister uh, magisterial districts, they don't have sheriff's departments. They employ constables, which is an old English version of a law enforcement officer. So long story short, um, I got into being a constable, delivering and serving warrants for the magistrates, uh, retrieving people on warrants and bringing them back to the bench uh, for the judge to levy any sort of fees, fines, taxes, committing people to prison and actually driving and delivering them uh, to the county correction or um, the municipal jail. So I did that for uh, almost two years. And that was really my first foray into armed security. And um, when I moved to Missouri, I kind of made the decision that I had dabbled in law enforcement enough and I was ready to move on. I got back into running my own businesses and then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, I really had to take a look at everything that was happening in the world and ask myself, if the local government can mandate that I shut my, my business down? Is this something that I want to continue doing moving forward? I don't believe that, and this is not to get political, but I don't believe that the things that we saw in the past uh, year to 14 months, that that is the end of that type of thing. I think that's the beginning. So I have already lost, you know, I'm 43 years old. I've already lost so much time, so much energy, and so much money 
in running my own businesses, opening my own businesses. And I want to do something where I can be in kind of a foolproof um, profession that is going to be needed. And with everything that's going on with the defund movement, I feel like armed security and just being in security in general uh, is something that can be pretty lucrative going forward. So that's how I got here. Well, that's one hell of an introduction there, Damien. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for your service. Absolutely. I, I, I really appreciate that. I say that in all my videos. Thank you for, for your service, all the veterans out there. Um, some other videos, I mean, my videos are a lot more, I get a lot more political, but for me, veterans always come first. So I really, I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, as for your background, uh, I think I did a video a couple of weeks ago where I, I mentioned you and, you know, you speak very articulate, very confident in what you have to say, but I don't want somebody to think that you can just see in California, in order to work private security, you get what's called a guard card, mm -hmm. uh, where it's about 40 hours of training. I don't want people to think you can just get a guard card, work security for a month and have their own channel and give great advice, give tips give great tips and speak as articulate as you when I mean, you're 43 years old, it, it, it took you a lot to get to where you're at. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and you know, we're all the sum total of our experiences. So you have to remember that, you know, I come from being in the military for that time and then working for multiple businesses before opening my first business. And when you open a business, when you're a small business owner, you, you learn very quickly how to interact with people that are of different races, yes. people that are of different religious beliefs, and people that are, are of different socioeconomic backgrounds and different tax brackets. Because if you're running a business, you need everybody's money. And I didn't learn that until a lot later in life. I used to be very, you know, in, my, in, in running my business, very brash, very aggressive, uh, maybe playing into my more thuggish side when I was a little bit younger. <laughs> and, you know, when you're young and somebody tells you, hey, man, you might want to dial that back a little bit. And then you think to yourself, no, I'm going to be me. I'm going to be me and I'm going to do things my way. Well, that's all well and good. But, but the people that you're looking to get their dollar, they might not buy into that. So, you know, when you get a little bit older and I have four kids now, I have two kids in college and um, I'm very aware of how finite time is because I've made so many mistakes. So I'm at a point in my life where I'm just trying to do things the right way, present myself the right way. And then also with this channel, maybe help some people not make the same mistakes that I did because guys, you're literally going to be my age that fast. Yes. And, and, and you'll look back and you'll see how much money you've left on the table just by making stupid decisions, being irrational with how you deal with people and just not carrying yourself the right way. So I don't want to do that anymore with whatever time I have left. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. The next question. So we did talk about how you got into pr the private security industry. Can you talk about your first day, month, or even week on the job as a private security guard? Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a funny story. When I, when I moved here, Part of moving to, well, the main part of moving to Portland was to work for the Multnomah County Sheriff's Department. Mm. Um, I had already gone through uh, the hiring process with a local police department in Missouri. So we're talking about, um, you know, a place that has about 30,000 people. Okay. They wanted me to sign a five-year contract for $32,000 a year, and I just wasn't going to do that. So we made the trip to come visit Portland. My wife's family lives in Portland. And I looked up the Multnomah County Sheriff's Department. They're making $68,000 first day. I'm like, I'm going <laughs> to go ahead and apply. And I applied on a Thursday. Friday, I get an email, send us your resume. On Saturday, I get send us your references. On Monday, I get click this link and take the test. On Friday, that next Friday, when can you come out for an interview? So I'm like, oh, my God, baby, we're moving to Portland. I'm, we're going to go. I'm going to make $68,000 a year. Wow. We're going to be set. Well, we do all of that. And when we get out here, everything just stops. The communication stops. Mm -hmm. The emails stop. It's nothing. 
So I, luckily I, I, you know, I find this company that I'm working for now and I get in there and I'm thinking to myself, like, I am going to avoid the downtown protest like the plague. If you guys remember last year, every night when you're looking at the news and they're talking about Portland, Trump is sending the federal troops in and you've got the wall of moms. All of that stuff is happening two miles away from me. (laughs) And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not even going to look in that direction. And when I get hired with this company, they go, we're doing executive protection with the news. You're going down to the protest. Wow. So first day on the job, first assignment is to go with another officer and shadow him as he does executive protection. This is late July, early August of 2020. Google July, August, Portland protest. And look at what was going on. You're t- we're talking thousands of people downtown at the Justice Center. You know, <sighs> tear gas and, you know, people throwing fireworks and, and bricks. And I mean, literally just, I cannot express to you guys how crazy it was. You talk about a trial by fire. I was there from from late July, early August, all the way through the election. Wow. Were you plain clothes or did you have a uniform? Plain clothes. Plain clothes. Wow. (laughs) That's crazy. Um, Okay. So it looks like you did work the Portland's autonomous zone, right? I did not. Okay. I didn't work the autonomous zone. So for anybody that doesn't know, um, there was a situation, I believe this was in December, November, December. There is a a historic home that's called the Red House, okay? Okay. This house is downtown in a a neighborhood. There is a family. uh, They are of mixed race, I think, maybe American Indian and Black or Black and White. It's it's up in the air. What happened was, man, I don't know if I'm going to... Okay. There was a... There was a situation where someone in the family was involved in something that caused legal trouble. Let's say that. Okay. To the best of my understanding, the family placed the house that was left to them by previous generation, placed the house up for collateral for his, this person's bail. Wow. Okay. Um, the house was then either, either the bell was defaulted on or somehow the house goes up for auction. A third party person purchases the home. The people that are within the home, this is all leading into where they're starting to kind of talk about, uh, there being a eviction moratorium, Right. Yes. So if you remember last year, like leading into like the the colder months because of COVID, they were talking about doing an eviction moratorium where legally you could not evict people. Okay, if you guys remember all that. And that's coming to an end, I believe, at the end of this month. Well, what these people did in this home, their situation, uh, situation of having their house sold to somebody else, to the best of my knowledge, happened in like 2018 or 2019. Okay. And they had been squatting in this house to the best of my knowledge. When the COVID moratorium came up, they jumped on the back of that. And along with the Antifa movement here in Portland, refused to get out of the house. So the person that had purchased the house was trying to evict them. Okay. Antifa in the area got a hold of this information and they basically cordoned off an entire city block. They descended on this area with weapons, Jeez. with tons of people. They barricaded the streets leading into the area where this house is. They completely cordoned off um, areas like it was like a war zone, like literally. Wow. Now. There's such a backstory. <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> so the mayor and the district attorney and our city council, who are all staunch activists, 
liberal activists. Yes. Okay. They just let this happen. So this house doesn't sit in a cul-de-sac by itself. There's like apartment buildings and there's businesses and there's other homes. So all of these people that are, that are there, that are around this, they're literally having to check in and ask permission to go into the wow. autonomous zone okay. that now Antifa, quote unquote, is, is protecting for these people. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so the police department refused to go in and do anything. They wouldn't go in and disrupt this. They wouldn't go in and shut it down. They, you know, the mayor wouldn't send in the National Guard or anything. And they were telling the news it's too dangerous. If we send the police in there, they're going to get shot. It's it's just it's a war zone. They're, I mean, it's just like they're making it out to be escape from L.A. Right. Right. <laughs> now. Now, let me backtrack. OK, this is where everything this is where the Multnomah County Sheriff's Department, me moving here. Yes. Where this. Right. And where this story all intersect. OK. So when I moved here in July of last year, the first thing I did is look up my gun rights. Awesome. And it says that Oregon is a uh, constitutional carry. Um, you can open carry, right? OK. Well, not so fast because Portland, which sits in what's called Multnomah County, okay, is, as we can see, a completely off its rocker liberal ass state or liberal <laughs> ass uh, county. Okay. In 2013, 2014, Multnomah County passed an ordinance because the Oregon law says that it's a constitutional carry, open carry state, except for each city and county can adjust that to however they see fit. I'm paraphrasing. Okay. So Multnomah County, who believes that guns are bad, they passed an ordinance that says that you can only open carry. Hear me when I say this. Okay. You can only open carry if you have a concealed carry license. <laughs> open carry. If you have a concealed weapon license. Wait, it gets better. Okay. Or you can open carry a firearm just so long as you don't have ammunition with you. Oh, come on. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so I've got to get my concealed carry license. I'm a law abiding citizen. I'm a patriot. Yes. Whatever. Okay. Where do I get my concealed carry license from? Oh, it's at the sheriff's department that is currently being occupied by Antifa every night. <laughs> so they're open from like 10 o'clock in the morning to 1115 in the morning. And then every other time it's barricaded close. Wow. All right. So I, you know, figure out this one time that they're open. I go in there, I get my information and they go, well, you've got to have a class on how to handle a firearm. I go, I'm a veteran. Right. I've had a concealed carry license in three different states. Well, you got to have that. You got to have proof of that. And um, then we're going to need your fingerprints. Why do you need my fingerprints? Well, we got to run it through the federal database. Okay. Here's my DPSST card. Mm -hmm. I don't get this card without them running a federal background. I don't get this veteran card without being qualifying on a nine millimeter and at my time at uh, M16. Right. Well, it's what you got to do. Okay. No problem. Jump through hoop, jump through hoop, jump through hoop, bring it back. And they go, we will get back to you in three months. <laughs> so they uh, by, 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 by county law, they have 90 days from the date that they receive your information to process your, um, your concealed carry license, right? Yes. All right. So August, September, October, November hits. I email them. Where's my concealed carry license? Oh man, we're really backed up, you know, this whole riot thing. And I go, yeah, I know. Guess where I work? With the news organization standing directly across from your front door 
watching the protest happen every night. So I end up emailing the district attorney, nothing. I email every city council member, nothing. Email the mayor. I contact everybody. I'm like, hey, I'm working in, in not in law enforcement, but in a law enforcement capacity. I'm a veteran. I've already had my, you know, I, I, I've had a concealed carry license, three different states. I did everything that you told me. You said 90 days. We're well past the 90 day mark. And they send me back an information or, or an email and they say, you'll have it by the end of November. End of November, nothing. Contact them again. Yeah, you know, COVID. I'm like, hey, I'm not playing. I want my concealed carry license and I want it now. So during all of this time, that's when this Red House thing happens. <laughs> and so I'm like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. So I said, you know what? Here's my chance. Because who have I been working with from late July all the way to this point, the news. news. So I grabbed my phone, I wow. put my coat on, and I said, I dare one of these, and I'm just gonna be 100% real here. I'm sorry for the language, but I get so heated. I said, I dare one of these motherfuckers to try something. Right. And I walked all the way through the autonomous zone and I recorded everything that was going on. And then I emailed it to the news station. Wow. So the news station is like more than happy to say, let us hear your thoughts. And I gave them exactly what I wanted or exactly what I what I thought. Specifics of the agreement between the mayor and the Kinney family are unclear. Right? In a statement, Mayor Wheeler says his goal was to find peaceful resolution to the situation on North Mississippi, saying in part, my focus has been on protecting lives. I maintain measured optimism that we can accomplish this step and move toward the next steps to advance the safety and well-being of the family and the safety of the neighborhood. Before an agreement was struck today, we obtained exclusive video of what it looked like from the ground inside the barricade on Mississippi Avenue. This video was taken by a Portland man, and it shows just how large the setup is. K2's Allison Mechanic spoke with him today about his experience. And Allison, what did you learn? Well, Catherine, Damien Bunting does not live on Mississippi Avenue, but that's where he found himself on Saturday morning. He recorded everything he saw inside of the barricade, but he even shared with us his feelings towards the situations. He tells us he was completely surprised by just how many people were back there, but he's frustrated with the situation and the city. Portland seems As a like Portland a, resident, a Damian Bunting wanted to see what was going on behind the barricade surrounding the Red House on Mississippi Avenue. Before going in, he says he was stopped and questioned by a person at the front gate, but was ultimately given permission to walk around and record. Bunting says the barricade takes up several blocks. You can see some of the fencing, boards, and tents here. Bunting says he was questioned several times by walking around. He was never threatened or chased out, but says he began feeling uneasy after realizing just how many people were there. I didn't feel like I was in any danger, but then I kind of started thinking to myself, there's more people here than I assumed at first, so I should probably just go. For Bunting, the walk around the barricade was eye-opening and frustrating. The only people that have a direct line to Ted Wheeler or the district attorney are the criminals. That to me is the most frustrating. Now, this was the second time that Bunting went out to the barricade on Mississippi Avenue. The first time was on Tuesday, and he says while he was out there, he saw people carrying handguns as well as AR-15s. He says it was pretty different when he went by yesterday. Once he got into the barricade, he was even offered food in Northeast Portland. Allison Mechanic, K2 News. So, <laughs> I after this happened, I contacted the Multnomah County Sheriff's Department that is in charge of the concealed carry license. And this is where people have to make a decision. Your desires versus your principles, right? And I was absolutely livid at the fact that I can work for the state of Oregon. I can work for a private company. I can protect newscasters. I can protect people in a retail establishment. I can watch a building. I can protect property. But the second I'm off the clock, I have to walk around and be unarmed where they've decriminalized heroin, methamphetamine. They have 40,000 homeless people and my life. My life doesn't matter. Everything matters. But my life doesn't matter. 
right? Every black person, which there's only 6% of the people in, in Portland are black, right? Yeah. But everybody in this town is wearing a fucking Black Lives Matter shirt. But when I argue my fear of being unarmed, uh -huh. I get told to kick rocks. So after this whole autonomous zone thing happened, I contacted the Multnomah uh, Sheriff's Department and I talked to the person that was in charge of the uh, concealed carry license program. And I said, where is my concealed carry license? This is the last time I'm going to ask you. Man, we're just really backed up. I said, okay, listen to me. I said, I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. I am going to contact Andy No, Tommy Lauren, Alex Jones, Fox News, and every conservative pundit that I can find. <laughs> and I am going to send every copy of our email interaction, the email interactions that I've had with every person in government here. And I'm going to have you explain to whoever reaches out to you why a black disabled veteran who has served this country and is working in the capacity that he's working within Oregon is being denied his concealed carry license. I'm not going to disclose what the conversation was from that other person's point of view, but guess what? That next Monday, I got my concealed carry license in the mail. Nice. Awesome. But guess what else I got in the mail the week after that? You are no longer under consideration for employment with Multnomah County Sheriff's Department. Unbelievable. Oh, now, geez. here in Portland, all you hear about is the fact that we can't find good officers. Officers are leaving. Officers are quitting. There is no respect. People don't want to do the job. I would put on a police uniform in a heartbeat. I have served my country and I would damn sure serve this community. But the fact that I stood on a principle that in this area doesn't align with the ideology of the people in power, I am no longer worthy to wear that sheriff's department uniform. And you know what I say? Their loss. Yes. Because ultimately, if they don't feel that this is important to a, to a disabled veteran who's literally out there fighting the same fight that they're fighting with none of the resources, with none of the backup, with none of the, um, with, with nothing at my disposal, then fuck them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, if I am so, I am so happy and comfortable where I am with what I'm doing. And the only thing that frustrates me and makes me angry is that it should have never come to that because yes. in my opinion, shall not be infringed means shall not be infringed. You can walk around Portland and you can identify as a goddamn pterodactyl and people will give you respect. But if you want to, if you want to say or do anything in relation to your second amendment, somehow you're in the wrong. And that's, that's just, it blows my mind. Jeez. Well, th thank you for sharing your frustrations on a state, well, actually an area that does not honor your second amendment. And, you know, you fought for those rights. Um, you know, you, you stood your post in the military. I mean, you never, you never left. And I just, I, I'm also a bit frustrated. I never heard the story before, which you mentioned that you, you know, the, these law enforcement agencies, they're out there saying, Hey, you know what? You don't have to be somebody rioting. Just join us. And you can make a difference. And then somebody that's willing to make a difference, somebody that just wants their Second Amendment rights honored, they just shut them down. I mean, we, we already know that there's that there's that there's a nexus between you complaining about your CCW and you applying for that agency. I mean, that just that, that, that wasn't the agency for you. No, it wasn't. <laughs> and you know what? I'm OK with that. And I actually I was going to make a video somewhere down the line. Uh -huh. And, and talk about the importance of people, you know, standing by their principles. Like as you get older, the only thing, you know, Scarface, my balls and my word. Huh. <laughs> you know? And as you get older, you, you start to understand, man, my wife and I were talking yesterday about all the things in life that we don't have anymore. Like the cars that I've owned, you know, the house that I used to have, the, the furniture, but you know what? Like none of it matters. Like what matters is who I am as a man. 
Yes. And, and, and if that is my battle to fight just for my own personal uh, second amendment rights, then I needed to fight that. And whatever I lost in the, in the short term, it wasn't for me, but I'll tell you what, my damn 380 is right here, <laughs> like it always is. Nice. <laughs> nice. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. How would a private security officer that is sent to a rough neighborhood, a rough area in Portland to deal with all the chaos, what's the best way that somebody can survive in an environment like that? If you're a security guard, the best way for you to survive is to remember that you are a security guard. In Oregon, there's no duty to act. I would love for you, since you're a, you're a really good instructor, Thank you. I would love for you to go over uh, duty to act versus no duty to act. And then some places have no obligation to act. Okay. So no sure. obligation means like, you know, you don't have to. Uh, no duty is like, you really don't have to. Like, we will not hold you accountable at all if you don't. So here in Oregon... Security guards fall under no duty to act, which means no matter what is happening, you under no circumstances are responsible to jump in that. So if your job is to watch an apartment building in a very bad neighborhood here in Portland, and you happen to be working your post and you see three Antifa members breaking into a car and spray painting, you know, something on the hood of that car, your best way to not your best way to make it home is to not get involved, to simply observe and report. And I think that security guards put themselves more times than not in more danger than they have to. Now, that being said, what if it's a situation where you're seeing someone that's being harmed? Well, this is somewhere this is a, a place where you're going to have to have a discussion with yourself on where you're willing to, um, to to walk those lines. But I think to just simply answer your question, your best bet is to do your job, which is to observe and report. Stay within the lines of what it is you're there for. Don't go outside of that. Every degree that you step outside of that line is another notch that you're getting closer up to a situation that you didn't have to be in. Um, and I know that I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody else. I have more trinkets and tools on my duty belt and vest than probably anybody. <laughs> it's cool. And it makes you, it makes you puff your chest out a little bit, but at the end of the day, you know, especially here in Portland, I know in California, these people aren't playing. They're not, no. they have nothing to lose. These people that live on the streets um, these people that are in that gang life, most of them have just resigned themselves to the fact that they're not going to get older and they're never going to be anything. So if you're like me and you have a family and you have this desire to grow old and die in your bed in the old age, don't put yourself in a situation where you're not going to be able to come back from it. And that's both physically and financially, because it doesn't have to be a situation where you get harmed. You can approach the wrong person, say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, and find yourself in court. And most companies are just going to cut the court. So be very aware of what your post orders are, uh, what the parameters are, and stay within those lines. Okay, fair enough. And I, I definitely have to agree with you there that observe and report is the way to go. Um, I mean... Me and Damien were about the same age. I think you're maybe two or three years older than I am. There's a, a good saying out there that says, a wise man learns from the mistakes of others, but a fool learns from their own. And I think at one time in our life, um, we were both fools. And maybe st still we do some fool stuff. But you guys, listen to this advice. This is solid advice. When I was 18 years old and I got into private security, I wanted to go out there and be the, be the – the gun ho guy, um, it, you're not going to get anywhere. And then you, when you start developing, having a family and everything else, and then you get injured because of something happened at work, your company is not going to back you up. Um, you're going to be injured. You might get disability, but that's not going to pay the bills at, at the end of the day. So 
hey, that, that's perfect advice, observe and report. And just because you observe and report, that doesn't mean you're not doing nothing. No, you're doing your job. Absolutely. That you're doing your job. You're observing and reporting either to the police or you're reporting to maybe a supervisor or the owner of the company. So I love the advice of observe and report. Okay, so number five, what are your personal goals, your professional goals, and your goals for your YouTube channel? Uh, personal goals um, is... How do I want to say this? I have a I have a financial number in mind that I've never hit before. Okay. And my personal goal is to hit that number. And partly because I was not a I, I'm gonna say that I wasn't a good student in class, but I was, I just didn't apply myself. And I didn't come from a family that pushed education. Um I was very lucky when I got married the first time, my ex-wife's family is, they're all educators. And having 20 years of distance between when I got married to now, seeing how having a family of educators that push uh, my children, my my ex-wife and I's children uh, educationally, seeing how that affects them and how that's setting them up for their future, I'm so I'm so jealous of that. Right. Right. Uh, That being said, I've always been a hard worker, but being a hard worker and not being educated has put me in a position where I've done more manual labor than I needed to without getting the financial reward for that. So moving here to Portland, I've really tried to put my nose to the grindstone and, and work as hard as I have always worked. But now I feel like I'm finally starting to see a little bit of a financial reward for that. And I have given myself a financial number that's not, it's not very big, but it's a number that I've never hit in my entire life. And at 43, I just want to prove to myself that I can do it. Uh, Professionally, I'm working on something. I'm not ready to announce what that is, but I am working on something within the security industry. I'm not opening my own security company. That's not what I want to do, but it revolves around helping people and more importantly, helping officers. When I look at what it was like for me at 42, making the pivot into security, um, I can clearly see where a lot of gaps were in terms of what I was looking for. And I'm looking to fill those gaps moving forward for other people. Um, And then what did you say? What was the third one? Um, YouTube YouTube channel. channel. Man, I want to hit a thousand (laughs) subscribers. And the reason why I want to hit a thousand subscribers is because then we can do some live videos. Um, But, you know, I am moving into diversifying my YouTube channel. So I will continue to do my debriefs, which is where we do topics. And I give you my top three or top five things that you can do to make yourself better and look better and all that stuff. Um, But then... You know, I kind of realized the other day, we are not security guards. We're not law enforcement. What we are is we are human beings who happen to work in security and law enforcement, right? Yes. So when I look at my life, there's so many things that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about helping people be better security guards. I'm passionate about being a better security guard. I'm really passionate about firearms and gun rights. I'm really passionate about my wife and my family. And I'm also very passionate about politics. And I actually thought last year about potentially running for a political office here in Portland. But the more I thought about it and the more I've kind of like just been here, this mentality that rules this area is not going to change. It's ingrained. People are, they're, they're trained up in it and the rush that people get by virtue signaling, they're never going to change that. And I think that I would just be beating my head up against a wall to get involved in politics. But what I can do is I can have conversations with people about politics and I can have conversations about uh, family. I can have conversations about two way. I can have fam- conversations about firearms. So one of the things that I want to do with my channel is develop these podcasts where long form conversations like this are happening because that's a a way for people to get to know me better, to get to know more about my life and see me as a a total person and also 
to get to hear from people and talk to people and, and see them as total people. Um, and I think that all of this will help me to achieve, uh, achieve those other two goals. I think that the thing that I want to do, and hopefully I'll be able to announce that in the next coming months, if we have more people on the podcast, those are people that I'm making connections with that will be able to help me with the thing that I want to do uh, professionally. And if I can get the thing that I want to do professionally to create these inroads with other people that are more successful than myself, then ultimately that'll finally bleed over into my financial uh, desires as well. So I'm really trying to utilize YouTube for more than just entertainment. I don't see it as like just social media. This is a way for me to connect with people within my industry and on the fringes of things that I'm uh, passionate about and, uh, and have them be in a position to help me do things for myself and for others. Awesome. Well, what I do like about your channel, it's like you're on a journey and we're hanging on your back. I mean, we're seeing everywhere you go. Um, I too love firearms, firearm training. And I remember that you did a review of uh, bushcraft or fieldcraft survival. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a course that I was interested in, but I like how it was just a, a journey. And then you were trying to raise funds to get to the next course. Um, so I think it's really exciting to, you know, watch you on this journey. You know, you talk about your struggles in life. There's, there are a lot of things that I don't feel comfortable mentioning on YouTube. And there's a lot of self-disclosure, you know, people, people trust you. And I think I subscribed to your channel. I think you have about 40 subscribers and then you're going towards it, towards the 800. Now that's awesome. It just shows that there's a lot of people that have trust in what you say, trust and confidence. And what's blowing my mind is that like, you know, just by talking to people, I'm starting to be introduced to so many other people and it's just opening up all these avenues. You were talking about raising money to go to that second, that second class. I'll, I'll be very transparent here. I pay, you know, I, I make my decent wage, but my rent in Portland is over $2,000 a month. <laughs> oh, okay. geez. And then on top of that, I have, you know, four kids, two kids that are in college. Jeez. I have um, child support that I have to pay every month. So, you know, that doesn't leave a lot of money left over for me to go, you know, taking a course on carbines. But I need to take a course on carbines. Yes. And I feel like, you know, we can rate every paycheck. I look at how much is taken in taxes. And here in Portland, they supply food stamps. They supply medical care. They supply free needles. All of this to the homeless gets taken out of my paycheck. And what I've told every person that will listen to me in this area, you don't bat an eye. You don't care that your police department allowed an entire city block to be commandeered by Antifa and for people to have to ask an 18 year old holding a firearm illegally if they can get to the house that they're paying a mortgage on. But you allow your tax dollars to come out of your check every two weeks. And all I'm asking you for is to give me $25 to go towards my training and I'm literally the person on my block that keeps all the homeless people from doing drugs on our doorsteps. Jeez. And people didn't want to do it, but enough people did. And I did. I raised enough money for me to go to Sheepdog Response in Utah in September. Nice. And I look at that situation and I go, let's just repeat that. And let's repeat it again. And let's repeat it again. So it's... This YouTube channel has been one of the only things some days that has pushed me to go to jujitsu. I don't need to do jujitsu to become a black belt. I need jujitsu because I'm literally dealing with people who are trying to kill me. Yes. Right. I don't have to go and learn carbine or close quarters combat because I'm trying to be a Navy SEAL or a police officer like someone would comment. No, I'm learning that because guess what? As a security guard. They don't teach you that. No, they don't. But when I work with another company down in Chinatown, guess what my job is? From six o'clock at night to two o'clock in the morning, go to this building, use this key fob and go through and make sure there's nobody squatting in this location. Downtown Portland, one officer, 
So close quarters combat comes yeah. in handy, doesn't it? Being <laughs> able to poke around a corner with a firearm and a, and a light, it seems a lot more necessary and applicable under that circumstance, right? But people from the outside look at it like, oh, you're trying to be a Navy SEAL. All you think you're John Wick. No, motherfucker. <laughs> like, I want to get home and see my wife and kids. And there's no, there's no security training where they teach you this stuff. But if you get online and you do a little research, there's all these companies and they're everywhere. And guess what? I found companies in Portland that uh-huh. do it that I didn't know were even here. Companies started in February. And I'm, I'm going to see them on Tuesday. I'm going to interview them for the channel. And guess what? By interviewing them for the channel and putting their information out, what do you think that got me? One free class. Ah, oh, 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 the owner's, <laughs> oh, the owner's phone number. Hey, I see on your Instagram, you guys are shooting. What's that gun range? Oh, that's a private gun range in Washington. Come out. We'll show it to you. See, nice. this is how you take something like YouTube and you flip it. Yes. And you utilize it to, to, to help benefit what's most important to you. And what's most important to me is getting home to my wife and kids so that I can be that old man who dies in his bed in his 90s. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And last question is, what's your advice for anyone wanting to make private security a career choice? Is, is this a viable choice? What's your, what's your opinion on this? I think it's a viable choice if you find the right avenue. When we look at things, here's a great example. Most guys in high school, let's just take football. Okay. You ask you, at, well, let's say basketball. It's a basketball season. You ask a kid right now in 10th grade, what do you want? I want to go to the NBA. Right. Okay. So he works his ass off. He plays D2 basketball. He blows his knee out his junior year. Is his NBA dream done? I'm asking. He blew a knee, you said? He blew his knee out. His knee is gone. He'll never be able to use that knee again. Well, to him, it seems like it's done. Only if he's looking at it as, I'm going to be a player in the NBA. When you look at the NBA basketball game, you've got 10 players on the court. You've got a head coach, an assistant coach. You've got seven trainers. You've got 15 doctors. You've got a psychologist. You've got a person that is literally there to squeegee the floor every time somebody falls down. You've got somebody that brings the equipment out. You've got somebody that is holding the camera. You've got somebody that's doing marketing. You have someone that's a sports agent, right? My point is, is that If you're looking at, I want to be in the NBA as I just want to be a basketball player, that is a very, very, very small dynamic in terms of whether or not you can be successful. But if you look at it like the entire NBA, okay, I can't be a basketball player. What does it take to be a referee? Now, if you think about being a referee in the NBA, guess what? You're standing next to LeBron James, right? You've got the best seat in the house. (laughs) <laughs> you're involved and those guys make great money. If you're a marketing executive, if you're, you know, any, anything. So when people look at security, they tend to think about the guy that's holding a clipboard at the mall or the guy that's sitting behind a desk, you know, at some office building. Yes. Those are two aspects of security, but guess what else is security overseas contracting? Yes. Guess what else is security? Executive protection. Yes. That's what else is security? Bodyguarding. Being a nightclub security officer in Vegas. Working casino security. Armored car driving. Being the guy in the back of the armored car that has the shotgun that's just watching the money all day. My point is, is that security is extremely lucrative. The guys that work for my company, not my company, but the company that I work for, yes, these guys are making great money. And they're making great money because they're not beholden to doing just one aspect of security. They've branched out and they've done so much more. They're working for so many different people, so many different companies. They're doing a little bit of executive protection. They're doing a little bit of cannabis transport. They're doing a little bit of money securing. They're doing a little bit of diamond transport. Security is huge. 
It encompasses everything from cameras to private investigating to home security systems to situational awareness, all kinds of stuff. So everyone that's watching this video, start to broaden your thought of security. Get out of the Paul Blart mall security guy. Get that out of your head. That's tunnel vision. Open it up. Get a 360 degree view. Take a pen and write down everything that you can think of that has to do with security. And from there, find out where you can plug into that and you guys will make more money. And I'm, I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this from personal experience. You'll make more yes, money than you ever thought was possible. Okay. Thank you for that advice. Is there anything else that you'd like to comment on before we come to a conclusion here? Um, the last thing I want to leave you guys with, and I know that I, I hope you don't feel like I've been commandeering this whole thing. No, no, no. Th no, this is an interview on you. <laughs> um, you know, DEFCON 3 says know your worth right? Yes. And um, I think that it's important to know your worth, but it's even more important to know what is valuable to you, right? Yeah. If that's time with your kids, uh, it, for me right now, it's time with my wife. Yes. So yes. I have told her Sundays are yours. If my company calls on a Sunday, I'm willing to be fired before I give up that time unless she okays it. <laughs> because I, I need her in my life. I do. I need her. She's my rock. Yes. You no. Know? So guys, find what's valuable to you and set your, set your boundaries. Um, because, you know, most companies, they'll work you every single day, all day long until you drop. And then they'll hire somebody else. So in the, the pursuit of getting your personal goal, financial goal, professional goal, also make sure that you don't lose sight of what's most important to you. And just kind of set a boundary around that and insulate that from this job, because it is easy to just get completely engulfed in it. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, those of you who are watching this video, make sure that you subscribe to a typical security guards channel. It's, it's the, the sec security guard channel, the security guard channel, the yeah. security guard channel. There's no way that you can forget it. You guys are going to learn invaluable tips um, by somebody that's mature somebody who has been there and done that um, somebody who's still learning you guys you guys are gonna you guys are gonna love this channel there's a specific reason why i interviewed him um, i don't think i have any interviews no i don't have any interviews on this youtube channel but i wanted i want his channel to be the first channel that that we discussed first person to interview um, definitely if you guys are a private security company owner make sure that you subscribe to the channel as well. And here's why this is your guard force. This is the people that are working for you. These people are putting their life on the line to help you live a more comfortable life. Um, and everything that he mentions, don't take it as a grain of, well, just, just don't throw it out the back door. I mean, really, really pay attention to the things that he has to say, because again, this is, this is your workforce. They could, they can, promote your company or they could destroy your company as well. I mean, very, very, very simple. Make sure that you guys subscribe to the security guard channel. Um, he's going to also post this video on his channel. If you guys have any questions about this video, uh, po post in the comment section below on his channel and then mine as well. You know, we're, we're definitely working together on giving you guys better content. Otherwise we'll close and I just want to thank you very much, Damien, for being on the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. I really appreciate you having me tonight. It was excellent. And uh, I look forward to, to working with you again and one day having a beer with you, bro. <laughs> of course. All right. You have a great one. All right. You too.